Hey guys, welcome back to Tom Girl. This is episode 32, and we're here with the one, the only, Andy McAfee. Stay tuned. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Oh. oh. Can you sing along? Can I remember the lyrics? I don't know. <laughs> you know the best way to go. Oh, that's so You're awesome. Just trying to help them. My I can't remember the lyrics. <laughs> there you go, guys. That's Andy. She is singing this track. So she's here in the studio. Voice over extraordinaire. Hi. Welcome to Tom Girl. I'm JJ. You can follow me at Tom Girl TV. And I'm so excited about this guest tonight. So we have Andy McAfee. Andy, tell everybody where they can follow you and welcome. Um, it's just my name, at Andy McAfee. I spell it a little weird. It's A-N-N-D-I. And then McAfee, like the virus scan. I did check it like a million times to make sure I was putting everything right on. <laughs> I put it okay. like, double in, double in. Okay. It's very yeah. rare somebody spells my name correctly, so I'm used to it. <laughs> just call me anything with two syllables and I'll, I'll respond. That's awesome. <laughs> well, it's so much to talk to you about because you have your voiceover, you're um, on camera acting, you have your own app now. So I'm just going to dive uh, right in. Let's, let's first, do it. Let's first talk about your voiceover career, some of okay. the animation stuff. So that was you singing on that first clip that we, yes, we heard. So that, tell us about that, that character. That was me singing as the character of Sarah, who is the, the three cute. horn in the Land Before Time franchise. So cute. What a cute little... She's pretty cute. Right? She's pretty cute. I, I, yes. She's one of my... <laughs> One of my favorite characters to play yeah. because she's so grumpy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I've been doing the voice of Sarah since I was 16 years old. Wow. And we just released the 14th movie. That's amazing. It's an amazing time to be able to put out content now because, you know, why not? Yeah. Keep going. Keep bringing uh, these franchises to new generations. And luckily, I'm still along for the ride. Yeah. What do you think it is with this one that just let it made it able that it could keep going like that? I think it's just a group of kids, a group of friends. They're all different. I love, I mean, the songs never leave your head. They're <laughs> great. They're easy to sing along with. I don't know. I just think it's, who doesn't love a good, happy story mm -hmm. with a bunch of different kinds of diverse characters doing all kinds of, you know, going on all kinds of adventures and exploring their world. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's why. <laughs> How did you uh, go about developing this, this character? Well, did you... so with Sarah, she's actually not a character I was um, lucky enough to develop. She was already established. So there was the original Land Before Time, which, mm -hmm. which uh, was in theaters way before I was even in the industry. And then the original Sarah, Candace Hudson, actually did her voice for the direct-to-DVDs for 2, 3, and 4. And then I believe it was uh, a decision that her parents made that it was time to leave Los Angeles and the business. I think that's the story. And so they needed to replace Sarah. So I took Candace's performance and just put a little bit of my own hmm. spin on it. So 16 at the time, and I actually knew her. She went to my high school for like a year, wow. which is a pretty crazy thing. Uh, that such is, a small world. Yeah, that oh, is very, so small. Yeah. And then, so I, I sort of uh, took the essence of Sarah, but you can't just copy a character. Mm -hmm. You have to be the character. So you're always going to put a little bit of your own spin. So she was more of a character that was developed. Mm -hmm. What kind of spin, what kind of, well, add, I mean, would you add on in there? I mean... For me, I had to kind of take the way that I get kind of cranky and grumpy and know-it-all. You know, she did her version of what it feels like for her to be kind of a know-it-all and a little bit of the bossy one in the group. And I had to kind of go with my experience, at, you know, 16 years old, of what mm -hmm. it felt like to be kind of in con want to be in control and, you know, what limited ex experience I had of that at 16 uh, years old. Yeah. <laughs> and put that spin on it. Like but everybody at 16 like knows everything, right? We oh, know yeah, it all so then, right? It wasn't that much of a stretch, <laughs> but I was uh, already kind of inclined to that kind of yeah. personality. Let's we'll put it that way. That's great. <laughs> well, I think we have another one here. So this was... Um, oh, we have a little son. One more song that we're oh, gonna we're gonna yeah. play, and then you can hear the backstory of of the, the music behind this. Hello. Yeah, this is pretty play. awesome. Do I miss you? Count the stars, multiply by ten. Such a sad song. So cute. Of so sweet. Yeah. yeah. This is a song that Henry Mancini wrote uh, the music to. And this was probably a job that I had to go audition for probably like six times. I believe, it's been a while, but I believe I sang um, Over the Rainbow as my audition song. And then I think I had to go in and sing live at the piano for one of the uh, callbacks. And 
when I booked the job, I got to go to Henry Mancini's office mm -hmm. and we practiced a little bit and it was just, I mean, of course, I couldn't comprehend at the time how much of a privilege it was mm -hmm. and what a legend Henry Mancini is. I just thought he was the nicest person and I loved singing with the piano. We got to record in a studio here in North Hollywood, actually, or I think it was like Burbank. But, um, you know, he was there playing the wow. piano for the job as many times as it took to get the take. Mm -hmm. So amazing mm -hmm. experience. When you were auditioning for that, now, do, are you one, do you get nervous in auditions? Or no, you just let it, no, uh, yeah. I, I, I just, I find that a lot of people freak themselves out with auditions. I don't know, there's some sort of level of, um, you know, what you imagine your performance is gonna come, uh, is going to look like, and then, what actually happens on mm -hmm. the day. But I've kind of learned over the years, maybe this is a strategy I've developed because I've been doing this for so long, but every every performance is gonna be different, every single one. And you have to roll with it. And even the performances that don't match up to what you had in your mind are, are experiences and, and uh, uh, their reflections of where you are in that moment. So mm -hmm. every single one is special, even when it doesn't turn out the way that you want. And it's all just part of your journey and part of the actor's journey. Mm -hmm. So I don't really get nervous because I don't, I don't know. I don't really know what the, what's the worst that could happen. Yeah. It doesn't really affect me. I don't think that the worst is even anything that's, <laughs> Yeah. You know, right. All that spectacularly bad. <laughs> yeah. You're just not going to get the job. Yeah. Whatever. That's a great <laughs> attitude to go in, though, and have them, like, let go of that stress. I get and really worry excited. About it. Yeah. I, I get anxious because I'm so excited that I get to perform. Mm -hmm. So I think I get yes. that kind of level of of um, a freaked out, but not in the way where there's a fear. It's right. more just like, oh, I can't wait. So you get to use that instead yeah. of it shutting you down. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it leads to me reading things way too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so how is this character? Tell us a little about like what your favorite things about this character. Um, well, she was, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, this character. Wait, which character? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Robin? Yeah, or, Robin. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, it was a big deal, and I was aware of that as a kid. It was a big search for the right, you know, actress to play Robin Starling and Tom mm -hmm. and Jerry, the first feature film of the, you know, very famous, legendary Tom and Jerry duo. So it, I knew it was a big deal mm -hmm. at the time. And, and, and to get it, I don't know, I was always like a 30-year-old and a you know, 10-year-old body. It always was a job for me, and I loved to work. So it was... Mm -hmm. It was really exciting. I just did my own little girl voice. Like I said, it, when you're a kid, it's really difficult to do characters. You just kind of do aspects of your own personality. Mm -hmm. Like this one's like, you know, more of a, a Tom girl. <laughs> and uh, this one's a little bit more of a sweeter character. Or this one's, you know, the, the, the character whose parents are, are not taking care of them and it's a sad story. Like there's really only aspects of your personality that you can play. Mm -hmm. And then as you get older, you start to, you know, uh, experience and learn more about how far you can go. And that's when you start to create characters. So at this point, I was just being my own, my own little self. <laughs> you, yeah. yeah. So now, now at this point, how do you go about like if, if you just get something from scratch where you don't have a lot of details, how do you go about oh, yeah. layering your characters? If you get any details on auditions, it's like, woo! <laughs> um, you know, I love to create voices. I always have. My, my brother and I used to get like stuffed animals and Lego sets and build worlds and give all of these characters voices even when we were really young. So I've always been doing that. So I just try to go with whatever makes me feel happy mm -hmm. and that I would want to hear on every audition. I don't care if it's animation or commercial or promo or narration. I just want to be the character that I would want to hear. Mm -hmm. And whatever happens, happens. Great attitude to have. <laughs> well, here's another character that, um, do we have uh, Phoebe? Yeah. Uh, Phoebe Heyerdahl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, um, that is my very first character that I created. So when I auditioned for Phoebe, this was back in the 90s, <laughs> um, Hey Arnold had already been uh, animated as a pilot, and there were a couple kids that had already been cast. And then it was picked up, and all of the cast, most of the casting was already done for the main group of kids, except for Phoebe. Phoebe mm -hmm. was sort of an afterthought. They just felt like the main character, like Helga, needed a sidekick. And so they wrote the sidekick into the show, and they animated it, actually, but she didn't have any lines. So when I went in for the audition, they just wanted to make sure I sounded different than, you know, my, my best friend. Uh-huh. And originally I did just a little bit raspier version of my own voice. It was a little bit lower down here. And I really only had like one or two lines when I first got hired. And then, you know, as the scripts came out and I, I, I got more lines and then I had this relationship with all the characters. 
Helga was so in your face and brusque and um, you know bossy <laughs> that I really wanted Phoebe to be the exact opposite. So I started to get a little bit more, you know, subservient mm -hmm. kind of and shy. And I wanted her to be the opposite of Helga. Mm -hmm. So my voice for her changed and became this character. And it was never my own voice after that. Mm -hmm. And that happened in about, I don't know, I'd say about four episodes. And then it's been the same ever since. And now you just were talking earlier about how it's changed with now, how Hulu kind of changed the yeah, franchise. Yeah, Hulu changed what happened with Hey Arnold. So we wrapped up Hey Arnold. And, I, and you know, why ever, uh, why ever, however it ended was not shared with us as kids. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. It was just like, you know, at that time I was doing other cartoon series. And it's just like it ends, it ends. But, um forgot about it right for all these years and still kept in touch with the cast and with the creators and the writers and especially craig bartlett who is the um, creator of the show like he and i and some of the other cast would just go hang out with him just to see what's going on just to stay in touch and we just do these casual lunches every couple of months and then hulu came out <laughs> and nickelodeon um licensed out or, or shared uh hey arnold on hulu and suddenly everybody could binge watch Hey Arnold and oh yeah, I remember this show and, and then a new generation could find it and watch it whenever mm -hmm. they wanted. So Hulu, I think, changed the uh, the trajectory of Hey Arnold because I think the trajectory was nil. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, there's social media, there's streaming mm -hmm. and those two things combined, people could find each other who really loved the show. And they started uh, creating art. They started making their voices known about how much they love this um, the show. They started a petition, and now you're Nickelodeon, and all of a sudden you you this is right in front of you. You know, uh -huh, social media uh -huh. is instant, and I think it was really uh, the combination of those things uh, that that sort of suggested to Nickelodeon there might be an audience for this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we finally, after uh, we're greenlit, after I think it was 12 years since we went off the air, we were greenlit to, uh, for a, a, a movie that wrapped up a lot of the cliffhangers that were left over from the series. I mean, never in a million years did I think that was yeah. going to happen. One yeah. day I'm just going to lunch with Craig like we normally do, and he's like, yeah, so I've got some news for you. And I was with um, um, one of my friends, Olivia Hack, who's on the show as well. And we were both there, and he tells us, we, we've been greenlit for the movie I have always wanted to do. <laughs> and we're just like, no. Yeah. Really? And then, of course, the next question is, are we going to be in it? Yeah. Because <laughs> right. you don't know. Yeah. You don't know these days. I mean, yeah, if they change the story up or what they would decide to or do. Or if they replace yeah. it, because we were kids when we started the show. We didn't know if they would want to... Uh, return to the property with a, a new generation of kid actors or what the deal was mm -hmm. so so how then um, so what was the process then when you did get that I think we have a picture of you from the the new number oh, four. That's like, our little yeah. rap party. oh that's where we screened the movie right before it came out oh. to, the, to the public that's me and that's Craig Bartlett right there <laughs> and a bunch of Arnold's and Helga's <laughs> and that shirt I wore is uh, so Phoebe my character has a little bit of a, a, a crush on Gerald mm -hmm. who's uh, one of the other lead characters and it's like a very understated crush and it came about because uh, Jamil who plays uh, Gerald and I were just kind of screwing around in the first like two or three episodes and there's a, an episode where we're on this boat and he asked me something about how you know are you okay and I say something like well I am now and we were just yeah. I was just messing around with him he's a little bit of a flirtatious kid yeah. didn't she and did she kiss happened. him once I no, believe I believe that there's a kiss on the cheek in the movie. I thought okay, yeah. Yes. So finally. Thought... But there's always like little hidden clues that they've got something going mm -hmm. on. It's never explicitly stated. It's just always sort of alluded to. Mm -hmm. So um the thirty three is his number, so yeah. I, I wore nice. it for the screening. <laughs> what were your favorite parts about the movie? Or being Pretty in the movie? Pretty much all of it. <laughs> just I, I mean, aside from the fact that it wrapped up all of the sort of um questions that we all had leaving the the series it was just being back together with mm -hmm. everyone we never got to experience um an audience reaction the way that we have all these years later we went to comic-con together so i, I mean yeah. it was just uh, so special to be able to we're, we're like a family and to be able to do all of these amazing things with your family at, at this point, you know, with the mm -hmm. nostalgia and, 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 and the fact that I guess it was really hard for me to really truly believe that there's such a large audience out there who loves it because we never got that feedback. Yeah. So, you know, you're still always sort of questioning it. Like, do people really watch this? Yeah. Do they really love it? And then you show up to Comic-Con and there's a room of 2,000 people yeah. who are like, yes, we're here for you. 
it really hits you and it's such a special experience. Yeah, that is the great thing about social media now is that you know right away where before, you know, people weren't tweeting it out or weren't, mm -hmm. you know, talking all, everywhere. And now you can see all that instantly. Um, so I want to talk more about Comic-Con because I saw you do yeah. a YouTube interview and it was kind of like you were a little blown away by it. Yeah, it's it's just unlike anything you can ever imagine at least for me i'm i'm i love people and i i do well in small groups but i i get really uh, i get bad anxiety when i'm around a lot of people i just it the sounds i think i'm so attuned to sound because of what i've been doing and and be, because of the other work i do in voiceover so animation i i don't think trains your ear the same way that promo or a commercial does and I'm so, um, I, I do a lot of, of promo and commercial and, and some narration. There's not a lot of it for women, but I do some of it. And I think those things train my ear and I am so um, sensitive to sound because of it. And Comic-Con is just overwhelming mm. with sound. So it's just, it was a, it was a little bit of a, a difficult experience for mm -hmm. me, but parts of it were amazing. You know, being able to sign autographs and talk to fans and some of them brought artwork and, and hearing about like what a show does for kids growing up with it, like how it impacted their lives. You know, it's different being on the other end where you, where you read the script and you're a character, but when, when you have people who are uh, experiencing some things in their lives that are difficult when they're kids and the show speaks to them, I mean, oh, yeah. I'm going to like yeah. get, get yeah. emotional. That's my favorite part of, yeah. of Comic-Con. Ah, oh, that's great. And I mean, come on, it's pretty awesome to be at Comic Con. <laughs> I would just think I do love to people watch, and I think it would. Oh, I could just imagine just watching people yeah. all day yeah. long there. Yeah, you can see it it's, all. And people are so joyous. Mm -hmm. I love being somewhere where just people are just yeah. so happy and and supportive of each other's fandoms and uh -huh. just you know exploring. I don't know. I love all that kind of uh, that emotional environment I yeah guess. yeah well you mentioned uh, commercial and promo work as well yeah. so let's switch over to talk about that a little bit so I know I hear your voice on the Today Show some and then <laughs> yeah. you come in and work for me yes. on CBS daytime spots mm -hmm. and do a, she does a fabulous job I do so. spots for ABC as well <laughs> sorry I get around just kidding just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so talk a little bit about the differences between, you know, completely different worlds. Yeah, and... uh, so there are some people in voiceover. I mean, voiceover is such an immense um, space to work in. And there are some people who do animation and never touch the other parts of voiceover. And then there are some people who do um, promo and never touch animation. And, you know, you can do one part of the voiceover industry and make a great living, you know, and get really good at it and never even glance at the other ones. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a woman who loves the challenge, so I love to be the best at everything. <laughs> because it's it's more about being better than I was a year ago. It's not about competition with other people, it's about pride in, in the craft. I really do believe and experience and live this fact that voiceover is a craft. And it's a little bit disappointing when I, when I uh, when there's a trend where people who don't, uh, I guess, work in the craft or, or work mm -hmm. at it, uh, kind of like it falls into their lap, but it is what it is, you know. I can't be mad, but it's disappointing. So promo and commercial, for me right now, commercial it, it is the easiest thing for me, I guess, because the trend, which is fabulous, is um, very intimate, so it's just like talking like this, mm -hmm. you know, really, you know, one-to-one. -one. It's just like talking to your friend and telling them about something really awesome. And that really lends itself to my personality because um, <laughs> I like to just sort of chill and tell you what's going on. So that's that's really easy for me, and I love it. But promo is the biggest challenge in my life right now, and, the, and I think um, that's speaking to me right now the most. Uh, promo is dominated by men, especially network promo, especially mm -hmm. primetime. And that's where you know how valuable your voice is based on the pay schedule. And we go by the union, by SAG mm -hmm. After's pay schedule. And net code is our golden standard of payments for promos. And what that means is there's a certain agreed upon amount and uh, for the main spot and then for what we call tags, which is mm -hmm. the, you know, next, tonight, next week, tonight at seven, tonight at eight, only on, you know, so mm -hmm. those are the tags. And, um, when you do when you do promos outside of net code it's pretty much the wild west it's a free for all yeah. there's negotiation every single time you do one so that's why net code is the standard and that's mm -hmm. why for me that tells you whose voice is the most valuable yeah. and in in primetime net network promos you will 99% hear men yeah so for that's me true. 
that's a challenge. That's a glass ceiling. I want a breakthrough. I want to be the voice of the network. I want to be the voice of The Bachelor or something that, mm -hmm. you know, that I that that appeals to the type of demographic, my age range, that I would just talk like we're talking now. So uh, that's that's why I think it appeals to me the most. And um, I want to be that person who who my style appeals to net network executives and they see where I'm going with that and they start putting more women, not, not just me, but other women mm -hmm. who, who uh, have a, a different perspective about how your network should brand itself. Mm -hmm. I definitely fully, fully support you. That my, my <laughs> other job is I work at the network, and I have definitely. I always, you know, love to hear more women on there, and it mm -hmm. definitely is. Uh, I, I do hear it more, but it's definitely breaking through kind of the old school what people are used to hearing yeah. on the network, and you know. But it's but also it's, it's not just about hearing women though. It's about the read. Yep. So this is, I think, something that one of the things that happens in voiceover is everybody hears a commercial voice or an announcer or you know a promo announcer and they and they they hear them but they don't necessarily know what they're hearing they just sort of accept what they're hearing right mm -hmm. and only when something breaks away from that do you stop and go oh wait that's that's different and so the read for women i feel also needs to change because right now when you think of a show that's very dramatic for some reason it's like what we call the voice of god you know mm -hmm. you've got that man that talks to you in a world mm -hmm. that growl thing or up next on nbc mm -hmm. you know that thing but when a woman <laughs> reads a dramatic role they try to push her to read it like a man would and you don't have to be that hyper masculine sort of booming voice mm -hmm. to uh, get somebody to be interested in a dramatic show. So um, I think it's also the read, not necessarily just only having women read the, the copy, but the way it's written. It doesn't have to, it doesn't, there's no way to be like, it's a, it's a female spot, it's a feminine spot. But there is a language that's used that I do think is masculine. And that's what all the rest of our language, I think, revolves around, is, is there's a, a normal language which is masculine. And then we sort of have to adapt to make it less masculine. You know, so there's also what do you feel about technique wise, the difference between promo Ooh. and commercial? Because there's a okay. big difference. Uh, so honestly, I feel like it depends because yeah. uh, promos are uh, cable promos are moving much more towards the, the chill, yeah. like yeah. just talking to another person. They don't have to MTV, cut through as much. Those types. Yeah. yeah, but even like FX is a little bit more chill and uh, like a bunch of them. And um, there's so many out there now. There's so many uh, cable networks. So uh, there's a big difference for me between um, cable promos and network promos because even the way you record them. So network promos, most of the time, I get a little bit lucky with, um, with uh, the Today Show, but most, especially primetime, primetime network promos are you, what we call ADR'd or looped. So you already have a spot to put, to get, put together and we have to like shove our voice <laughs> in between whatever cues are going on on camera or, or uh, you know, whatever sound effects are going on. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really uh, specific skill set that's very difficult to practice. Where do you get to practice looping? It's not mm -hmm. like, you know, you can't just walk into a and go, hey, I need to practice looping. <laughs> it's, it's a really difficult yeah. skill set to, um, to show up to an agency and go, I'm ready to do network promos. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. And uh, daytime promos sometimes, although for CBS, you guys still do the, the looping style. But uh, for, for cable networks, you just record it and they squeeze it in the, <laughs> themselves. And, you know, you really never even have to see what's going on or hear what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in technique between the two of those. But commercial is starting, I think, a lot of... Uh, whatever selling or branding. So in commercial and, and in, in promos, you are branding, whether it's a product in commercials or a network in promos. Your job is to be the voice of, whether it's a car or a, a network. So I think they're starting to cross. Mm -hmm. I think some of the big, um, even the network promos like NBC has a, for the drama, has a much more relaxed voice, mm -hmm. even though it's the, the drama voice and you know that right away by the, the timbre and the tone of the voice. It's still much less, I'm talking down to you and more like I'm talking with you. Mm -hmm. What do you do as far as like, so you've been doing this for so long, but still to, to grow your craft and like to keep current with things like, w are there ways you study or are there ways you practice or do you just go for it? Um, you know what's really interesting is I think you can either follow the trends or you can be the trend. And for me, 
things that have happened in my life changed my voice. My voice was never this low. It was never this textured before. But then, you know, I got married. And there's, there's, there's a way that you identify in your life as you get older. You know, you're the single girl. And maybe your voice has a little bit more sexiness to it. And you don't do these things consciously. You just follow social cues. And you find that using a particular type of, type of voice gets you a particular type of reaction, right? And so as I've gotten older and I've had more life experiences, my voice has naturally changed. But because I'm a voiceover artist, I'm aware of it. Mm -hmm. So I can draw from some of the voices I've had over the years, but I've been fascinated by how much my voice has changed. I used to be such a clear, like clear as a bell. And <laughs> now I'm much more, because I'm more relaxed and more chill. I don't care. I don't have to convince people of things anymore. And that has been reflected in my hmm. style in voiceover. And it's been a really interesting transi transition. So I've tried to be ahead of the trends. And I've tried to talk in my auditions or, or perform in my auditions the way that I want people to um, to respond or that I think I would respond to. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's something that's so unique that, um, you know, clients and networks and, and studios start to come on board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you maintain this career for, for a long time 30 years. Had, for 30 and that's amazing in the since video. I was, yeah. Since I was practically born. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how, Oh, there's my talk. outfit. Oh, that's, that's, that's my cute. studio outfit. It's my bare pajamas. Uh, I yeah, but you're lucky that I'm dressed because I, most of the time it's not even that cute. I love I pulled that because as everybody says with Vio, it's like, oh, it's the best job. You can just stay home, do it from home in your pajamas, and I'm like, yep, yeah, and literally yeah, do. you do, and you can. Well, yeah. that's also because that particular one's like a 7 a.m. Se session from New York. <laughs> I was not getting dressed at 7 a.m. in the morning, but no, most of the time I don't. I wear my pajamas because yeah. you have to dress for your job. And my job is to support my voice mm -hmm. and wearing comfortable clothes that, um, you know, sometimes sessions can be like, I seriously was at the gym. When I used to do the, I was the announcer for the soup on E for almost nine years. And it's a like, really uh, next on the soup. Mm -hmm. And it takes every muscle to get that type of energy, but you can't cross over the line into too cartoony. So sometimes, especially with high energy, I will, like, it looks like I've been to the gym. It really mm -hmm. is such control over your body. I don't think people realize that. That one especially, because I watched The Soup for a long time, so I definitely know your voice from that show. And it was, like, you had to, yeah. like, yeah. What, any any fun memories from oh working on God, that show? The, just... the whole show was fun. <laughs> I still talk to some, some of my producers and writers from that show as well. Again, it was, like, a lot like a family. But um, that was an interesting, I think, of all the things that I've ever done, The Soup, taught me the most for promos, actually. Um, I had done a lot of like, you know, kids network types of promos before the soup, but there's, a, a, I think, because it's an announcer and announcing is really rare. I mean, think of, there's live mm -hmm. announcing like for award shows, like the Grammys or the, or the Academy Awards or whatever, but to be, an announcer for a show, like a talk show. I mean, how many of those do we have anymore? Yeah, I think I know Jose Priano does some, I believe, or he does the promos. I don't know if you know, does it inside? But yeah, there's very few that are like in the show exactly, like you were. Exactly. Like, right? mm -hmm. uh, and so I didn't really have much to draw from. I was, rel you know, relatively young. My voice is, at that time was a little bit younger than my age, um, just based on my experiences in life. But uh, the way that, so we would record everything they could ever possibly talk about in the show, right? So I'd have to go through like 40 different titles of the show and then they would just madly edit them together <laughs> in the couple of hours after they recorded it and before it went to the network to air. So um, I had to have stamina for that. But when I auditioned for it, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I got like a paragraph, like the opener, like up next on the soup, we do this thing and then we talk about that thing and you know, this happens. And so at the time, I just really um, thought that all those shows were freaking ridiculous. And so I just tried to make it as ridiculous as possible. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I never auditioned for an announcer before. And, um, and somehow my corny take on the, the stuff we were talking about resonated with the, <laughs> one of the producers who hired me, but it was a rough, it was a rough start. And hmm. this is one of those things where, you know, voiceover is, Yes, it's fabulous when you get a job and you and you, you nail it and you know yourself in that role, but there are a lot of times when you don't. Mm -hmm. When you think you've got a handle on it and the client's like, yeah, no, sorry. And the soup, I almost thought I was going to lose that job, to be perfectly honest with you. Because uh, the first maybe like three months, the executive, uh, one of the executive producers who actually directed me for the first uh, few months, he didn't seem like he liked my read, but when I would come into the studio to read it, something happened that 
he didn't seem like all that happy about it. Hmm. And he was trying to get me to differentiate between the thoughts because, you know, he's imagining how they're going to cut this all together. And I don't know. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, it had to be like, up next on the soup, we do this, this. Then, wah, da, 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 da. so the, the, it had to be more musical. It had to be different um, thoughts, but not to sing song me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't grasping that for the first few months. And I would leave that studio like wanting to cry because I wanted him to be happy yep. because he hired me. And, and, you know, it was rough. And then mm -hmm. one day it just clicked. And I'm lucky that I had a producer who was sort of training me because that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah. And that's the only way you learn. Yeah. So that was one of the jobs where it was really difficult for me to get my my bearings. And then I think the network was also a little kind of on the fence about me. And then at one point they were just like, eh, it works, whatever. Yeah. So what are some other lessons that you've learned along the way or things that like when maybe um, if there were any slow times or times oh, that, no. yeah, like you kept kept going or, you know, what, what other lessons have you learned kind of through this career? <sighs> wow. So, you, uh, I mean, I, everybody says this, but you got to have a thick skin. <laughs> uh, there have been times in my career where everybody loved me and I felt like I was killing it and oh finally people get where I'm going with this particular type of choice I made with uh, where I am as a promo announcer or or these characters like because I'll read characters that like I said I want to hear that character mm -hmm. and um, there have been times where nobody else wanted to hear that <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's rough it's not only do you have to financially plan for those times but you you have to be able to believe that um, you have to keep yourself busy just constantly working and you don't have a barometer so you may think wow I'm like killing these auditions and then you go like you know five or six months where you're not booking like enough to really mm -hmm. give you that kind of confidence and, and it really does break your confidence down and you don't know if it's because of just other things you can't control or if you're really not reading mm -hmm. the way that people uh, or what you're not reading the way that they um, are looking for in order to hire you so you just don't know mm -hmm. And you have to figure that out. That's why this is such a difficult job. How do you keep yourself out of that downward negative cycle of, you, you know. You don't. You, call, you crawl into your bed <laughs> and you cry. And then, you, you, you know, you have a little bit of ice cream and you just go, you know what? I got to do something with my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just, I don't know. I don't, I, I, like I said, at times you start to doubt yourself and you wonder, well, maybe this industry is changing and I'm just not what's next. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I ever will be. Maybe like the dead read of people who don't have any training is where we're going in this industry or maybe the cheapest of the cheap is where we're going with this industry you know I, I don't know mm -hmm. you just if you don't love it you're never gonna work you have to at least start loving it what is your take on marketing do you wait for stuff for your agent or are you out there so trying to push this is a very interesting thing about being in this uh, this biz for 30 years is uh, marketing used to be done for you when you did Tom and Jerry the movie and uh, you know it was Hanna Barbera at the time and uh, and T Turner I think did Tom and Jerry the movie they had publicists they would send you the things they would have magazine articles they had publicists who would who would milk every you know ounce of publicity they could and and you would be a part of that now I mean it's uh, it's very rare to to have that kind of or your agent would have some hookups or whatever but now it's like I feel like every every animation person has a publicist. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just it's not my style. I I'm I guess this is just who I am. And it's great for everybody. Everybody has their own thing. But I'm I'm really it's really important to me to just be as much of myself as I can. I don't want to push anything in anybody's face. I try to have as much fun. I love Instagram. I love pictures. Everybody's mm -hmm. happy on Instagram. Like I said, I love happy spaces. <laughs> Facebook, everyone has an opinion. <laughs> I don't want to hear your opinion I unless it's happy. But Instagram, it's just, I don't know, yeah. it's having a good time. It's my favorite, too. Right? Same for the same reasons. I am not a big social enough guest yeah, because I feel like everybody was mean. And I'm like, I get enough of that being in L.A. Right? Like, it's, I just, it, people, yeah. it is hard being in this industry, okay? It's, be nice. Yeah. We're sensitive. <laughs> but, um, so, I just try to be me. And I, I don't try to, I don't know. I, it's There's always that line of, like, this feels a little bit like it's, you know, advertise -y. But... When I'm really proud of something, I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a little bit pushy with what I'm doing because I, I want to connect with people and I, I want them to enjoy something as much as I enjoy it. But that's that's the that's as far as I can take it. Mm -hmm. That's just, I don't know. I'm not a big me 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 person. I'm I'm more, and and like I said, that's fine. That's some people's personalities. Mm -hmm. But I like to be private. So I, 
I try to only put things out there that are very like you know public and stuff that's mostly about my career. And every once in a while, I'll share something you know a little more private that I think is funny. Or but mm -hmm. I think marketing is important. But that's just the yeah. only way I know how to do it. We did talk about, and we don't have to say much if you don't want to give it away. But you were talked about maybe creating your own kind of. Oh yeah. So sort of. so what I. I've been doing voiceover for so long that there's some certain things about it that have really uh, stood out to me as really fascinating. And I, I'm a curious mind. And, you know, I'm, I, went, I went to grad school. I have a master's degree. I've always been fascinated by people and things and, and, and ideas and putting them together in unique ways. But I decided that I wanted to start my own content. So um, I'm bruised up my legs because I've been painting for two <laughs> days. And apparently me and a ladder don't go well together. But... Um, I created a studio in my house where I can start uh, filming my own content. But I really want to talk about, and I think this will resonate across all genres of performance, but um, what happens, like, what is that audition process like? Because I feel like everybody gets these stories of, yeah, I was just, you know, an on-camera actor, and I decided I was going to do voiceover, and here I am on 12 different series. That's not how it works. And I think it's really irresponsible to um, have that sort of myth in, in the world of Hollywood. And it happens with on-camera, mm -hmm. too. I went, I was standing in a McDonald's line, and suddenly I'm a huge star. And, no, there's, there's those times, like we were talking about in between, where you wake up and you bomb an audition mm -hmm. or you just can't get in that mood you can't get in that character how do you push through what does it yeah. look like to do an audition and so i'm going to do um, a little youtube series i'm actually starting this week i'm going to record it see how it goes but mm -hmm. um about some of the working voiceover artists who make livings and um i want to talk about how, why why do you do this mm -hmm. and you know much like what we're talking about about the times it doesn't work out and, and how did you get from, I want to do voiceover to what your audition process is right now? Because guess what? Before you work in that studio, you need to audition. Mm -hmm. And somebody has to send out that audition. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to listen to it. And then they have to hire you. Because who knows if anybody even hears your audition. So I'm going to show people in the studio doing their auditions. I think that's a great, I will totally watch. I think it's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, and especially now, because because of the internet and with, you know, technology, you can get more and more, like even at CBS, I get more and more auditions than ever before because it's just so easy so, for yeah. so many people. So yeah. there are all those people that are thinking that, you know, that even if they don't have an agent, they can send in. And But you're really, when you're listening, you're listening to like the first five seconds yeah. of that audition that comes in. So how do you break through, to, you know, to, yeah. to stand and, out from the, from the others? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and I wonder, like, most of the time, <laughs> is, is anybody actually even listening to this? Especially in animation. Mm -hmm. Like, is, is they really listen to these or they already have offers out? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So, it, it's, you just don't know. But you just have to do the best you can. And I'm just really passionate about it. I love, I love the voice. I mm -hmm. always have. And so, um, I'm just going to do what I'm passionate about. If people are interested, great. If not, I'm still going to be happy. Yep, yep, enjoy <laughs> it. Uh, before we move out of VO, any, like, last-minute advice for anybody out there that might want to pursue a VO career, like where they should start, what they should do? I really, so I've never had any um, training, like, formal training. I just, I just feel like there is technique, and you, and you do have to learn it, but just put yourself out there. You cannot learn until you do. Don't be so scared what's the worst that could happen, so you won't, get feedback or you won't get a response or you won't get a job, you know, whatever. Just, just, you have to do it. You have to wake up and you have to record a voiceover and put it out there somewhere and just keep practicing. And eventually maybe somebody will give you feedback or somebody, you know, will help you out or, or, or guide you. Just, mm -hmm. just do it if you love it. There you go. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> All right. We got not a whole lot of time here. And I know there's oh. a few more things that I want to talk about. Um, I talk one a thing lot. I meant to talk about quick, though, um, not quick, though, but one, you, um, things weren't always for perfect for you as well. No. You had a disease that yeah, you had yeah, to yeah. learn how to. Can you talk about that a yeah, little bit? Yeah. So, one of the challenges, <laughs> so I've been dealing with the, being a voiceover artist, but. Even though I did voiceover when I was a kid, the fact that I only do voiceover now wasn't necessarily a choice for me. Um, when I was in the middle of recording Hey Arnold and a bunch of other cartoon series and doing on camera, when I was 17 years old, I got really, really sick. And I didn't know what had happened. I just slowly lost energy to the point where I couldn't even get out of mm -hmm. bed. And it took a few months, but I was diagnosed with a very, very rare chronic disease. It's a bone and blood disorder called Gaucher disease. And um, it's... So there was only one type of treatment for when I was diagnosed for a long time. And it was, um, I, I, I don't, I have a gene that's um, sort of, I guess, defective. And, well, it's retarded. It's not, it's not, mm -hmm. um, it's like a wonky gene. 
And I uh, get an, I used to get an enzyme put into my body via an IV full of this enzyme that I can't make because my gene isn't built correctly. And so um, struggling, I, I had to stop doing on camera. Not because I wanted to, I loved it, but because mm -hmm. I had this you know, health thing I had to manage. Mm -hmm. And once I started getting the medication, like I started to feel better, but it was still, um, you know, there's side effects. There's, um, it's never a replacement for a gene. It's just getting by. So I would get horrible chronic fatigue. About I had to get it every other week. And so I'd get horrible chronic fatigue about five days away from my next infusion. And so I've had to live my life like that, you know, planning around the fatigue and around getting a nurse to come out to give me my drug, which took two and a half hours just to, for wow. the stuff to go through my body. Mm -hmm. I could never travel for longer than, you know, a week and a half because I would start, I couldn't enjoy traveling anyway. I would just start to become the zombie. So um, I've had to manage this career around, you know, even driving to auditions. It could seem like the biggest feat on the planet when you have zero energy, but yeah. luckily, the voiceover was sort of made for me huh. because technology has allowed me to work comfortably from my home mm -hmm. where I can easily manage this disease. But I've still managed to uh, have some fun in my life. It's just, it's just, you know, learning what normal is for you and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and going from there, adapting, evolving. Mm -hmm. So yeah, coming. that's that story. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, go back. We did real quick. Let's touch a little bit on your on camera stuff because oh, yeah. so you Baywatch. You were on Baywatch. I was the Baywatch babe. That's I was amazing. A so I was a junior lifeguard in two episodes, but I was a different person. Baywatch, they didn't care. Uh, I loved them. They were so much fun. So the first episode I did, I was a a, a junior lifeguard, but there was a twist my last wish i was with the make-a-wish foundation strangely enough because i had a very rare chronic disease Aww. but this is way before i was diagnosed with my own but her last wish was to be a lifeguard and so um she had a little romance with Ho with hobie and that was a really great episode and then a year later they're like hey come back and be another, another episode so i came <laughs> back great. as a different person and the whole different story and of course i got sucked into some cave underground and had to get rescued and you know yeah it was a great show it was so much fun yeah, they had the best fun. toys <laughs> i got to ride the wave runner around and spend a whole day they paid me to go spend a day on a wave runner driving around with a stunt woman on the back i knocked her off i was going so <laughs> good job i'm a speed demon <laughs> all right well let, that like leads us fast. to next let's talk about your adventurous side because you have a very something i really want to hear about your stint in the boy scouts <laughs> that, you heard it boy scouts not oh, girl scouts yeah. Guys. No, no. So my dad was an assistant scoutmaster, and I was just going with all the Boy Scouts everywhere that they went. My dad was like an Eagle Scout, and he was super like, you need to learn how to survive in the wild. None of this, you know, kind of... Um, Glamping? Yeah, yeah. He was like really hardcore, like would make you build a fire out of a shoelace and some sticks. So I started going on the hikes, and then when I was about 10 and a half year old, years old, my dad was like, hmm, let's, uh, let's, let's go for this. So I changed the spelling of my name to A-N-D-Y McAfee, and I became a Boy Scout of America. I got my boy's life and everything. Now the troop knew I was a girl, and they thought it was all kind of funny, but um, I went on all of the backpacking trips, and of course I was the first person there to every campsite. Uh, I, I never slept in the tent with the boys. I always was, was with my dad, but it was the best experience. And then one of the moms tattled on me and I got kicked Boo. out. Boo. <laughs> She was a bummer. Yeah, that was yeah. But that is Tom Girl right yeah. there. Exactly. So I, I grew up repelling. I used, I was so tiny that I couldn't even buy a pre-made harness. I'd have to make it out of like a <laughs> swami belt and a diaper. I used to have to make them out of like webbing. And then we would turn them around the carabiners and we'd go down face first. I was always the first one on the cliff. I got my hair stuck in a carabiner once. Uh oh. And my dad luckily had another rope and he had to he had to uh, tie it up and like he had to rappel down and cut my hair out. And then I, I was filming like a mini series at the time and I came back with like half my hair like sorry. <laughs> Oopsie. From then on I put it in a in a braid when I went rappelling. Smart, smart. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about some of your a couple of your other favorite travel oh, spots uh, and adventures wow, or adventures I've, you like. I love anything fast. I, uh, I took, <laughs> so um, my dad had this day where he was invited by a friend to like Club Lamborghini Day at Willow Springs Racetrack as my 23rd birthday. So he decided for my, for my birthday he would uh, let me come along. And so he had a Porsche, not a Lamborghini. But I brought my Lexus IS. I just bought it. It was like the 300. It was brand new. And I brought it to the track and I raced that sucker around that racetrack. And then I raced some of the, um, uh, the Porsches as well. 
So I love, oh, anything that goes fast. <laughs> I jumped out of a plane. I've been to Costa Rica whitewater uh, rafting. Oh. I went hiking in the Alps. Uh, my husband and I took a wrong turn and went on an 11-mile hike we were unprepared oh. for in June. We didn't have any water. Uh, yeah, I was really Did it get scary for, him. yeah. I'm like, I go to survival mode. I was a Boy Scout. I can survive in the wilds of Swiss Alps. But uh, <laughs> I was like survival mode. I got us through that. But I was really worried about him for mm. a while there. Yeah, he was really dehydrated. But we saw, we went 11 miles when we were supposed to go like three. Yeah. And, but it was by the time we realized we were kind of far away because it was all downhill the first like, you know, hour and a half. Or, it, it, to turn back would have been the same exact distance. Yeah. Just yeah. to just finish the hike. So... Anything left on your bucket list that you haven't done um, that you won't really die into? Uh, I like anything. At this point, I like anything corny, anything unusual. I Like, I've been, uh, <laughs> I went um, curling. <laughs> <laughs> if, <laughs> if it's weird, I'll do it. We went to a yodeling. The whole reason we went to the Swiss Alps in June is because I wanted to go to the yodeling competition. I waited three years to go. It happens every three years, and uh -huh. I just found out about it, like, right after it happened and I booked uh, a chalet in the middle of the Swiss Alps close to the yodeling competition oh. for three years just so I can go watch wow. yodeling in the Swiss Alps oh that had to be fantastic anything weird send them yeah. my way I will go do it yeah love it love it all right it's almost time to wrap up before we do uh, we each week here we do a Tom girl of the week so this week it is these this group of ladies if you guys watch the Grammys on Sunday it was just a spectacular performance you had Kesha, Cindy Lauper, Camila Cabello, Andrew Day, BB Rexa, Julia Michaels and the Resistance Revival Chorus and it was just moving and touching and everybody of course in white um, supporting the Time's Up movement um, it just was an amazing female empowerment moment so they are the Tom Girls of the Week this week. So before we wrap, I want to talk about what's coming up next for you. One thing I wanted to talk about was you have um, a fitness app. Yeah, I, I took kind of my journey with uh, managing because um, at some points in my life, depending on, you know, how my disease decides to behave, uh, it can be very physically challenging for me to do much of anything, but I love to be active. So I turned that into a fitness app that myself and one of my girlfriends do. It's called Fit Muses. We decided we're going to do the muses of fitness, but it's made for women. And essentially, we're trying to recreate what I find helps me exercise the most and most often, which is just chatting with another girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So we'll go do some exercise and we'll just chat about our journey to health and happiness, some of the things we're doing that that we would talk about with girlfriends. Yes. And you can just plug in anytime you want. You need some motivation because half the battle is just getting up yeah. and going and doing whatever it is. We don't care what you do. Just move your body for at least 20 minutes and we'll keep you company so it flies right by. Mm -hmm. So I love it. It's so much fun and uh, connecting with women all around the world is my favorite part. We have people who found us in all who, you know, corners of the world and all walks of life and I just love it. I love it so and much. And the app is free in the App Store. I downloaded it today. It's you free. guys can go to you can get it in the App Store store or it's a podcast whichever you prefer to use mm -hmm. and I what I love too is that it's different than you know in LA of course we have a lot of the you know real fitness minded like like yeah. like buffed out people yeah. and you know just what I loved is that it, would, it did just feel like the every girl, like yeah. you said, talking to your girlfriends. You know, yeah. we all have our issues with our bodies and our yeah. weight and different things like that. So it did feel like a, a, a fun community of just sitting there. You know, you you had a commercial that you voiced your commercial yeah. yourself. You it was fantastic. Yeah, I did. I'm like, oh, she did. That's awesome. But, you know, you show people just normal people on their bike in their house laughing and listening to, yeah. you know, making the time go fast. Because you do hear a lot of people that are like, oh, I don't want to get on the bike or the treadmill because yeah. it just, uh, you just go walk in one place think, for so long. And I think there's yeah. this there's this mythology in the fitness world that it has to look a certain way. You mm -hmm. have to be decked out the correct way. Yeah. You have to work out for a certain amount of time. You have to lift in order to make your butt look like this. You have to do these 10 exercises. And I'm over it. I'm over it. I don't care. I just want to go out and move my mm -hmm. body. I, I, I just want to have a good time. That's what, uh, Life is about having a good yeah. time if you can. And why not be positive about it and share it with other people who are trying to just... You know, be in a positive space too. Yeah. So, what kind of, because what kind of stories would they hear while they're oh, listening? Oh, just like, like I talked about like, Comic Con. I mean, I go into a lot of detail about some of the, uh, the the things that have been going on. And, you know, like just what it's like. I, I'm married for three years and it's like, that's a whole adventure. You know, marriage mm -hmm. is crazy. I love it, but it's crazy. And so, I talk about like just some of the, I don't know, things that I think that women go through or that they're interested in. Or like my girlfriend talked about her first pap, uh, not, uh, her first breast exam. Hmm. You know, she had to go in for that, um, you know, where they yeah, flatten your yes. breasts. I haven't had to do it yet, but she had no idea what to expect. And so, like, a lot of women have to yeah. go do that for the first time. And she was just talking about 
what it was like, you know, it's, and then she, like, she got a, uh, she got a, a gift for a massage at this random place once for house sitting for somebody. And she had a, she had a very special kind of oh, experience boy. there. <laughs> it's just stuff that like, yeah, you know, and she's back in the dating. I thought I'd read that she hadn't been dating oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, she's yeah. back in that world. So it's just she's like girl a, gossipy. She's got her second wind. <laughs> she's at a point That's... in her life where she's like, you know what? I'm not, I'm just done with serious relationships. I just, I just want to be me yeah. kind of thing. And yeah, she's uh, entered digital world of dating and it's, it's an adventure. And then I've got fun, like, fun. I, I'm the opposite. I'm like married <laughs> and trying yeah. to find space for my husband three years later for, for a closet, you know, still. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, then also tell us what other um, upcoming, you have some voiceover stuff coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I don't know when they're going to be on because I haven't looked yet. But I've, I've done like an episode of The Lion Guard for Disney Junior that'll be out. And then I did, I've wanted to be on this show forever. So I was very excited. I'm also on Robot Chicken season mm -hmm. nine. Um, I think I'm in the 16th episode, but I'm not sure. But if you follow me on social yeah. media, one, <laughs> one day I will know and I will share it with you. But it was it was a fun, fun. episode, yeah. Well, awesome, yeah. awesome. All right, any last parting words before we wrap up here tonight? Uh, no, just hi and thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time. It's, you're wonderful. It was so great chatting with you. So Yay! appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, JJ. You're welcome. All right, tell everybody one more time where they can follow you everywhere. Coming up next, um, <laughs> uh, Andy McAfee, just my name. I, I only use Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Sorry, Snapchat. <laughs> I, 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 I love Instagram, though, so you can follow me there. Oh, is this the stinky song? Oh, yeah. Is it? Hot and stinky. I love this stinky one. Yes. Hot. You're welcome. <laughs> you will never forget this song. I'm going to get my niece and nephew because they are so stuck in the fart poop mode right now. So they're going to love the there stinky song. There you go. <laughs> Usually we're not, like, the Land Before Time doesn't focus on that kind of stuff. but <laughs> I did see when Phoebe farted on the microphone. That, that was, was on that the was YouTube the last as episode well. of Hey Arnold. <laughs> Of the regular season. Poor Phoebe. Oh, All right, guys. Sorry. I digress. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again here next week. You can follow me at TomGirlTV. I'm JJ Jerkins. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Bye. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. I have no idea. Ooh. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.